I was. Um, my colleague Katie Miller and I are so excited to be here with you today. And we're going to tell you the story about a big leap of faith we took a few years ago and how that's worked out for us in trying to develop some innovations in child welfare, working with um, various partners. So, so I'm Amelia Frank Meyer. I'm the CEO at Alia, and um, uh, Katie Miller is our chief innovation officer. Um, we're located in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul of Minnesota. And um, Aliyah is a nonprofit that, although we're based in St. Paul, um, we work all over the country in, you know, somewhere close to 30 to, uh, jurisdictions or so each year. Um, and although we're grounded and not traveling to those places, we're pleased to be zooming around the world mm -hmm. and the country with you all here. So Katie, I don't know if you want to say hi quick and introduce the chat. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Katie. I'll just uh, pop in a little bit later on in our presentation, um, but would love for uh, the folks that are joining to offer your ideas on um, what would one thing that you would change about the child welfare system be. So if you could pop that into the chat, we really helpful to kind of get your ideas around the systems change and get get our um, um, you know just get us flowing in the systems change direction. So appreciate that. So as Katie's alluding to, our work at Alia is really partnering with um, mostly public, although some private child welfare agencies who are interested in building new ways of work that focus on keeping families safely together. And so we're interested in building new ways. Um, I'm, I'm watching the chat here, Katie, and we've got uh, stopping removal and family well-being and moving from uh, foster care to temporary uh, therapeutic respite and all these Great items here. Mm -hmm. So we had um, kind of a similar question that came to us a few years ago. It was in May of 2017, we started asking the question, how might we redesign a better child welfare system? And what we knew for sure is that we were not going to come up with this answer by ourselves in our conference room. And so we put out um, a call across the US to ask for 100 innovators to join us in solving this problem. We used a process called human-centered design um, and used a design firm, the global design firm IDEO, which is out of the San Francisco Bay Area out of the Stanford Design School. And for four days in May of 2017 in Minneapolis, 100 people came to help us answer this question. We had 10 groups of 10 kinds of people, so we ended up calling the event 10 of 10 for kids. So we had 10 innovators in state and federal child welfare, 10 in county child welfare, 10 in nonprofits. We said 10 people with lived experience, but it turned out that um, a third of the people had lived experience because they were also running government agencies, 10 innovation fellows, 10 people who knew nothing about child welfare at all, so they could say, tell me again why you do that <laughs> and could serve as a reality check for us. So you get the idea, 10 tables of 10. And here is this illustrious group here um, of the people who helped us to design for those four days. And at the end of the four days, uh, they came up with 30 different prototypes of ways that we could improve our work with children and families in the, in the public child welfare system. And they, they put together also some guiding principles for us. So these are really what we call sort of the hallmarks of an unsystem. And these are ways that we know if we're on the right track. So, so to be clear, the 30 prototypes that they developed, we then consolidated into a theoretical framework that we call an unsystem. And it's not the unsystem because there's more than one way to do it. Um, and we just know it's not this system. So we don't know what it'll be called in the future. Maybe the child and family well-being system or the family strengthening system. We're, we're not really concerned about what it's called or how we name it, um, but we know what characteristics it will have. And so there are lots of examples of unsystems happening around the country. And the guiding principles, the hallmarks of an unsystem are these. Number one, we protect relational connections as sacred which means that we separate children from their families 
um, use that only as a nuclear option because the fallout is far reaching and into future generations. So we do that as an absolute last resort. And I, I know we say last resort now, but we really mean it. <laughs> um, and then we nurture the capacity for joy. And that's not just in our kids and families, but in ourselves as well. That if we are helping our families, but it's burning us out or diminishing our capacity to parent or partner well, then we're doing something wrong. Helping people shouldn't hurt you too. So how do we develop joy for our children, our families and our, and our partners and ourselves? Insisting on racial equity and radical inclusion is about the idea that the current child welfare system is set up upon uh, assumptions that have a lot of systemic racism um, and, and unconscious bias built into the system. And so we're really interested in, in alleviating those disparities. Daring to share power refers to sharing power not only with our families and helping them to be involved in the work and to design what they need, but also with one another, that we're not the only people working on this. We know that this problem is so big and so complex, it will never ever be solved alone, that it will only be solved when we come together. And in order to do that, we must collaborate in new ways and share power. Uh, another guiding principle here is, um, is uh, working intergenerationally, so kind of up and down the line of not just with the children, but their parents and grandparents. Um, Katie, I can't see the bottom one of this. And I'm oh, sure. On it. Yeah, sure. Trust the wisdom of so children, children and, and families, families to, design to design their, own, their own, future. own futures. Thank you. So mm -hmm. uh, asking them to really say what they need and do that. And, and then the last one is our favorite. We use this quite a bit, this heart here. Um, is do what love would do. And that means if you're not sure what to do, if you have, you know, run out of ideas, do what you would do for someone that you love um, and, and behave in those kinds of ways. So these are the guiding principles of an unsystem and those are the designers. You want to move that, Katie? And at the end of asking them, how might we design a better child welfare system? Their answer to us was the perfect child welfare system actually already exists. It's called the family. Um, and we don't need to redesign the system to be as good as the family because it's not possible. In fact, all families struggle. My family does, your family does, um, all families struggle. And the question that we asked about how to design a better child welfare system, we really need to think again. The question should be, when families struggle, as they do, what do we do to keep them safely together? Right? Not how do we try to design a parallel system that matches the family because we will never be successful at that. It'll never be as good. So thinking about instead, how do we keep families safely together? So we wanted to just kind of walk you through, this is my very favorite diagram here, um, my very favorite. And I, I will kind of walk you through and tell you um, a bit about how we see this. So this, this is really about an evolution, evolution of a system. And what are systems really, except a bunch of people hanging out together trying to solve a problem, right? And this applies to all systems. This could apply to the juvenile justice reform. Frankly, it's got a lot to do with uh, in the US with our democracy right now undergoing some transitions. We have um, you know, educational reform, all kinds of systems. We're, we're working on police reform. So this applies to all of those systems. And what we know is that all systems are born on a beginning set of assumptions, right? We come together, we say, this is what we think is wrong. Let's build this thing to try to fix it. And when a system is born, then it develops just like, just like humans do. And in the middle there, when it comes into maturity, um, the job of everyone and everything in the system is to protect the status quo. So once we get this idea of this is how we're going to solve the problem, the funding all ties to that, people's roles tied to that and jobs tied to that. We have bricks and mortar tied to that. We have, uh, you know, really an in, in, in industry built around the idea of protecting the status quo. But eventually the system you know, we realize we know more than when we first started it and it doesn't produce the desired results. And so the system eventually needs to be put into hospice because it will start to fail and implode upon itself. A few other things about this I wanna point out are that the beginning assumptions in child welfare um, 
systems, especially in the US, were built around the idea that black, brown, and indigenous children would fare better with whiter families. It's also built around the idea that poorer children would fare better with wealthier families. And we know these assumptions to not be true. They've just been, you know, proven beyond a doubt. And so at this point, even if the system was producing results different than it is, um, we would be really morally and ethically um, compelled to develop new ways of work because of the embedded systemic and um, racism and implicit and explicit bias. So this is based on Margaret Wheatley's work. Actually, I'm not quite done, Katie. Oh, sure. Um, and Margaret Wheatley's work. And if you see those dots there, innovators, pioneers, and trailblazers, what she says is that when the system starts to fail, people will start to develop answers. So they'll be raising their hands saying like, I have an idea, I have a model for that. I've got a new, new way to do that. And what she says is that until we network those ideas and change makers together and develop a common way together, nothing ever changes, right? We just have a bunch of different models and our frontline staff are trained in seven different fidelity models, but they don't know what to do when they're sitting in front of, of families. So we're, why we exist and what we're up to and why we held the 10 of 10 early is really to build this new way alongside other change makers like our good friends at Kemp. And so this idea, this bottom line there, that, that perforated line is, and now we work together. Everybody knows, right? It's not working the way it should. Like we have super, a lot of common agreement on that in our field. But the challenge is, what do we do instead? What do we do instead? So we're busy building that new way with other change makers. And then that'll launch a new system, which will go through the same life cycle and will transition the people and the resources over to a new way of work. So just to give you a quick example, in the US, many of the federal dollars are tied to separating families. And if we build a new system that said, we should spend those dollars to strengthen families, to keep them safely together, then we would transition those dollars to a new way of work with new laws, new roles, and try again. Okay. So this is, um, the next slide is a picture of an unsystem, just to show you what that is. So the traditional child welfare system really built in ways that undermine family systems, includes a lot of blame and shame and punishment and disconnection of families. So when families struggle, and if they were to call for help, our help often looks like um, punishment or disconnection or blame or shame. And what those 100 designers gifted us with was this concept of an unsystem, which says instead the system should really build family well being and support build on healthy development for children. And these concepts then are at the core of an unsystem. There should be a whole family at the, the, put the whole family at the center, focus on building resilience and joy and well-being and health, have locally delivered resources that are available immediately. There was a lot of talk about that mm -hmm. in the prototypes, like mental health ambulances or how can families call for help and not worry their kids are gonna be taken away, right? And then supportive, consistent connections. And that refers to the way our work currently goes, where you might have somebody take the hotline call and somebody does investigation and somebody does ongoing, and somebody else does therapy. And then, you, got, you know, we have lots of people in, in our homes, but could we just have a person who could help us was a lot of what was said. And so really family driven and culturally specific support so that families could decide who they worked with and what they needed to value and build on family ties rather than to disconnect them and to use natural community supports. A lot of people talked about when they struggled when they were younger, you know, Mrs. Johnson would drop groceries at the door, take care of the kids while mom was suffering from sadness or what have you. So these are, this is what um, a theoretical concept of what an unsystem looks like. And at this point in time, then, as we've developed these ideas through the 10 of 10, what we have is a bunch of ideas, a set of ideas but nobody at that point had ever tried them. And so that was our next step. And so um, I'll just say a few words and let you pick up here, Katie. So, sure. uh, so if we move from a theoretical concept to we say, who wants to try it? <laughs> who wants to build this thing that we have dreamed up together? We'd love to see how it works on the ground. Could you build this? Could you do this? So we put out a national call for um, jurisdictions that wanted to do this and 10 answered and we tried to talk every last one of them out of it I promise you we did and five of them stuck 
And so the five jurisdictions you see that Katie will tell you more about were really just the people who said, we hear you, it's gonna be hard. We hear you that nobody's ever done this. We hear you that we don't know exactly what we're doing. And yes, we're really serious. We wanna stick it out. And so we got a three-year commitment from them to build on the ground the idea of an unsystem. Thanks, thank you. Um, and that was a great question, Lainey. Are these state-run systems or county-run? So we have a mix of both. We have um, four states represented and 14 jurisdictions. So we have, you can see from the map, we have two from Wisconsin, one from North Dakota, a, um, a county in Maryland, and then a, a 14 region county, a 10 county region in the Eastern Iowa service area. So this is our, um, this is our cohort. And I love that question because what we are learning is, is the richness that it adds to have different types of agencies represented. Um, largely, these, these, um, these places are um, smaller towns, rural, which we are finding quite also, also to be quite helpful because we have a little more agility. Um, it's not like we're trying to move, you know, Cook County or, 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 or whatever. And so we are able to be, um, uh, you know, a little bit be able to pivot some more. So that's that's really helpful. Um, how the cohort is structured is that you'll, you'll see here too, is that we knew that uh, we needed folks that were at a level of leadership that they could they could make change. So we have um, directors and then we brought their deputy directors or equivalents, they're not always called that, but the direct deputy directors with to be the folks that are kind of like implementing the change or it's really hard to have one person come back and try to do all this change. So they, they're just doing this together. And of course we knew that um, we would need some outside help. And so we, we found some of the smartest folks that we know of that have been in child welfare for a long time that have said that, you know, could be part of the process and say, you know, they tried that 20 years ago in this state. So let's, let's not do that again. Or, you know what I mean? So this, this really broad child welfare um, professional experience. And so we've been really blessed with having the guides, professional guides. Um, and we have also another set of guides, which are um, lived experience. So these are folks who have um, been uh, uh, our, our birth parents or foster parents or, or foster alum. Um, so have experienced the child welfare system in the involuntary way. Um, and man, they have just really added to our process too of, uh, and, and, and are just able, able to ask the questions like, why are we making that so hard? Or, um, you know, the things that we needed them to do. And so the, this group of, of folks we've been, we've been convening for the last uh, three years and have developed such a nice, um, you know, trust kind of currency together to able to be, be able to make change and make change and, and withstand the pushback that that we'll talk about just in a moment here. But I wanted to, to um, just to talk a little bit about what we've been able to accomplish by we I mean they but I'm going to just include myself in there because I also fill that heart space with this group of people. Um, so I'm going to say we and they. Uh, uh, what's exciting, uh, we'll get into the, the actual, the, some of the practice shifts here in a moment, but what's been exciting is that just even in, in the first about year and a half, um, which in after what felt like we weren't doing that much, we were able to reduce a, as a whole the uh, foster care placements by 12% and then residential placements by 37%. By, by, by what I, when, it, when I say we weren't doing that much, it was we spent a, a lot of the first um, certainly six months, really, you know, year thinking about what is it that we're trying to do here and how do we actually, what are the levers that make change and how, what can we actually do as, as county administered um, counties or, uh, you know, kind of just like figuring out like where are we trying to head and, and what, where do we sort of start and go and move and change. And so what was gifted to us, I guess, gifted to the world, it's a, it's a, um, a framework that is, um, open, you know, sourced by our friends at IDO, who are the pioneers of human-centered design out of the Bay Area. This was a model that is um, that is the change framework that we used for the cohort that we use for the cohort, and was developed through the, uh, IDO's work with an education system. And and what that is, uh, the approach is where you 
together decide on a large group aspiration. So really, what is it that we're trying to do? And it took us a minute to figure that out together. Like, are we just trying to, um, you know, stop removals? Are we just trying to, uh, you know, what metric are we looking at? Is it about placements? Is it about relationships? So we were able to come up together with, the, with a shared aspiration. And, and it had to be something that was um, you know, big enough, didn't sound like every, you know, dang mission statement you see on every website. Um, it had to be something that like energized us and it had to be something that would made us go like, I don't know, can we really do that? So we, we and, and something that matched for everyone. So, and we knew that every agency would have different expressions of that. Um, but so we were able to uh, sort out our, our group aspiration. And then what the process was, um, was, was, to ask ourselves if that was true in our agency, if family connections were always preserved and strengthened in our agency, in our community, what would we even be doing? What would the behaviors look like? How do you, what things would we say? What things would we stop saying? What stuff would we start doing? What would other people be doing? So we kind of sussed out some of those behaviors and from there, from, from the vision of the behaviors that you want to achieve, we could um, set out some, uh, identify some big ideas and then little hack. So this isn't rocket science, friends, is it? So it's like, where are we going? What might that look like? Let's get, think of some big ideas. And then we wanted to make it so bite-sized and so doable so that we could recognize our own change and be about learning. Because we knew that we're like, we didn't know where we were going. And we knew that we'd make loads of mistakes. And by mistakes, I mean like things that didn't really work that well. And so we did these hacks. And I just wanted to show, um, show you as well, uh, this is just a couple of, of examples about how the asp our shared aspiration was just, we could tell that it was right on because it, it just sank in, you know, it was just something that we were saying, like we started to show up on, um, you know, the, our email signatures of other folks in their agencies. And, and it was just like, okay, all right, yeah, that really works. And, and what we love about this um, shared aspiration is that it's about family connections. Like I mentioned, we thought, man, are we just, do we want fewer kids in care? Do we want, um, um, you know, is it about kind of like where people, where kids are, how long they stay? And we really thought, you know what, let's focus on the family connections because we knew that we wanted to be more about that, like that love and belonging than geography. So that's what we focused on. And we added, first we had family connections are preserved and strengthened. And we were like, that sounds nice, but I'm not gonna like, you know, jump up and down about it. And so then we added that always. And then we thought, could we always do that? Could we always in every placement and every decision and every meeting and every budget item, could we actually commit to always preserving the family connections that exist and strengthen that. So that what that's what felt like the challenge to us. Um, so as I mentioned, each agency kind of took off in, in some different directions about what that looked like, but there were themes. And so I just want to share those with you briefly, um, briefly now. So categorizing them is what you see in front of you. So one thing that we learned um, real hard was about preparing and taking care of yourself and your team. You remember that we have a group of leaders here, right? And so um, there is a, a, an element of leadership fortitude that's really necessary to take on this type of change, as you might all well know. So we spent a lot of time um, uh, encouraging them, making sure they're okay. Do you have people? Sometimes uh, they could feel quite isolated, not being able to you know, works through some of the things with their own staff. They felt like they needed a peer, peers to, you know, to think through some of these um, types of things. And so we really wanted to provide that support for them, which was really part of the magic of the, uh, the cohort model. So it was about preparing and taking care of your, yourself and your, your, your little team that you will be advancing the change um, with. Uh, we talked also about prioritizing the workforce capacity. Um, I, I know that everyone on this call has worked in um, probably a, a range of different groups of, on the scale of functional and dysfunctional. And uh, some of the you know groups are, you, you just know that you could do hard stuff with and some groups you just know you could not do. And so we needed to be able to help our leaders um, nurture the, the capacity of their workforce to be able to take on a big change. And that looks like things like 
making sure they're saying the hard things, um, being really transparent as a leader, which feels, feels super vulnerable. Um, that looks like, you know, even simple things like sometimes it's hot chocolate. Uh, it was, a, you know, in the, in the lobby um, and just reminding the staff that they are the valuable piece of this work. Like we know that this relation, this, this work is about relationships. And so that means that the work is about them as people. So we needed to con help them to constantly bring that back. And it was kind of like, you know, they never said this, but it reminds me of, you know, sort of being in a relationship and you're like, I told him, I already told him I loved him. How come they don't remember? You know, it's like this constant having to tell them like, you are, you are the necessary part of this change. Like you are really valuable. So this is the pre prepare and take care of yourself and your team. And then we spent a ton of time just helping, uh, just challenging ourselves and helping them to challenge their workforce into thinking differently about the work. What is the role of a child welfare system? Why does it, why are there so many, why are the disparities so, so deep and so wide? Um, what is my role in it? What, what I've been doing this for, you know, 20 years and now all of a sudden I'm supposed to change or is this even possible? So just really thinking differently about the work and to get really crystal clear on what is it, what it is that we're trying to do. Um, and, uh, and, and it was, it was that time too, where we prioritize when we were really investing in their workforces that and and um, helping them to think differently. And it was just like this plus this equals creative thinking. Like when you're in a space where you feel really valued and then you're kind of getting introduced to these new ideas and your team is kind of like gelling and vibing, then new ideas can just emerge. So part of the more tactical things was around uh, just a, you know, old habit, uh, habit, um, um, ta tactic of making the old way harder. You know, if you want to get more steps in, walk to work instead of take the butt, you know, that type of thing. So you just incentivize and make it easier to do the things that you want folks to do. And you make it harder for the things that you don't want them to do. Um, just really simply that looked in, in several of the jurisdictions about um, raising the, um, um, the, the level of uh, kind of authority that who, who could make removals. So sometimes it was the case that um, it was, you know, easier, easier for a social worker to just kind of sign the papers and do the removal, get the kids in a shelter. And then we had to go, oh, oh, oh wait, hold on a minute. We get, that's just way too easy. We got to call in more people. We got to make this, uh, uh, you know, put it up, put it up higher on the chain of command. Like there's got to be a lot more phone calls to be made because that is a really traumatic experience as we all know. Um, so it was um, uh, also part, part just slowing down. Like we know we don't make our best decisions on the fly often and, and alone. So when we're stressed out and by ourselves and feel a lot of pressure, we just don't make the best decisions. So it was slowing things down and uh, making the old way harder. Another piece of it was really leaning into um, families. This was a challenge that came to life, the guiding principles, of, as we said earlier, about trusting the wisdom of children and families. Like, do we actually, might we actually trust a family to say, this is what I need? And would we actually um, lean on, lean in there and, and trust them that they're the, the safe bet. You know, we do things like just to be safe. Like is that maybe the safe thing is to just do whatever they say they need. Maybe that's the safe thing. So that's, uh, you know, part of what we would do. And, and simply just, you know, doing our, our dangdest to stop removing kids when it's just not necessary. And there was, you know, and then we get back to this mindset shift about, is it necessary? Are they safe? What does safe mean? Who says if they're safe? What if they're physically safe? Can you ever be physically safe? So then we kind of get back to this mindset shift too. Um, and then the last one here that you are seeing on your screen is around expanding the group of helpers. And that was like from the beginning to the end, from the top to the down, it was the leaders. It's like, you gotta get more people on board with this. Like call your superintendent, you know, have, be in a great relationship with all these folks in your community, leverage your state support. Know that when things go, bad so you people are already knowing what you're up to and um and um and are on board with you like yes i know that's the that's that happened and we're going to deal with it and we're going to carry on we're not going to retract um so and that was it, it, at the leadership level it was at certainly at the family level like who does who who else here can help like let's ask 
grandma, let's ask neighbor, let's ask whoever you decide. There's just, it's, it's, a, it's a wide open table. It's a, we want crowded tables of people who are showing up to do this work with families um, and with leaders. So I am just gonna move on and share some of the more, the agency, agency um, statistics that we feel really encouraged by. Um, uh, in particular, the Eastern Iowa service area uh, initiated a practice um, they called child safety conferences. Um, it was inspired from a, a model out of uh, New York. And uh, again, this isn't, isn't something that's in a, you know, not rocket science, but it was a, a time sensitive meeting that at the point of any potential removal um, that instead of uh, they did have parent advocates, they have a very, very robust parent partner program in Iowa good on them. So they would have a child safety conference that included a parent partner, the parents, anyone else the parents wanted to be there, um, the social workers, their therapists, and then not even an, a supervisor, but a social, um, uh, um, a Sam, what's a Sam? Uh, social something, administrator, I can't remember what, but they call them Sam's, um, but higher up and there's only like four of them in the region. So it's like, you got to call somebody, it's like your supervisor, supervisor, and they're going to drive three hours to come to this meeting. And so, you know, that did a couple of things. You know, that whatever decision is made, you're, you know, that's good from the higher up and to us. So that we're going to do it. And the service area manager, Lisa for the win. Um, and uh, woo! And uh, so one other, the magic piece was just moving up the chain of command. And the, the, they just changed the question. It wasn't like, do we have to remove this child? It was instead, what do we do to keep this child safely at home? So like just the focus really shifted and, and it, it was just like, we're all on the same team. So they did, you know, in the, in the, in the data that we have, they did an initial, in the first um, six months or so, all the data are in the uh, case study. So you'll, that's where the correct data is. But um, uh, worked with about 111 kids and 94% of them um, uh, remained at home after the child safety conference. And then after six months, 74% were still at home. So this is, a, this is a, um, uh, an initiative they're now rolling out in, in throughout the state of Iowa. And I think maybe I'll just let you um, read the other data on the screen. Um, in the in the effort or in the in the interest of time, um, but also can wanted you, to yeah. Can I just say something yeah. quick? And please. And I think we have time. We still have half oh, an do. hour. Okay, yeah, okay, we have okay, half okay. an hour left. It's okay. Want to make sure people have no. We have say plenty. Things. Okay. Plenty of time. Okay. Um, but what I what I really want to just note about this is the cohort's not done. This is just the first year, right. and they didn't get like a whole bunch of money or a whole bunch of new positions and the laws didn't change the rules didn't change this is right. just kind of like doing it as we're doing it only thing that changed was their mindset right the support they got the mindset shift and so by thinking differently I mean <laughs> you know in Cass County the number of youth who ended up in foster care with unrelated people went down 43 percent in a year Right? That, this no joke. In Washington County, in one year, they reduced the number of children removed by 61% from 96 the previous year to 37. So it, these are very substantial changes for no big like strategic statewide change rollout, right. no big new investment, no right. rule law changes. This is just changing the way they think. And I think that's what we want to, one of the things we really want to share to you with you yeah. is just how encouraged we are that, you know, we often think like, oh, we don't have enough money or, oh, we don't have enough time or, oh, we don't have enough, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but really, if we, if we just change the way we think about things and tweak and change a few little things, you can get pretty dramatic uh, results quickly. I mean, this was a, in a year. And so um, I think that's an important part yeah. of the story. No, thanks for popping in and saying that. I, that that is really important. And interestingly, um, not n none of the well, may, maybe the maybe in Iowa, but none of the other ones were saying we're we're going to set out to um, specifically. Uh, um, decrease the number of removals. For, for example, I remember the mo moment of being on the phone with the leaders in Washington County and they're like, the state just called and said, what are you guys doing out there in Washington? Your removals went down, you know, 61% in the last year. And she goes, they did? And um, and so it was just kind of like a result of, of 
of you, I mean, like Amelia said, just kind of seeing things differently and making it a point to do um, your work uh, differently. Um, I'm just gonna, yeah, cool. I, I wanted to check the chat here to see that we were answering any questions. Um, I'm gonna say one other quick thing about yeah. Wapaka. <laughs> so Wapaka County, we have worked with for six plus years and they did their, they got down to zero kids in care. Um, and they're, they're a mid-sized, you know, a county, but they got down to, to zero. And so they were way ahead of the other um, jurisdictions in the cohort. And so they then were now able to take the savings from getting their residential population down and their deep end kids down. And they started, you know, their, their aspirational idea was really to move 50% of their budget to prevention. So they started, you know, moving their savings into the front end to hire prevention social workers. And mm -hmm. so their numbers had already dropped substantially in the years, the five years prior that we had been working with them. And we wrote a, uh, when I say we, I mean, Katie wrote a case <laughs> study on that called the Wapaka story that's free for download on our website too, about mm -hmm. how we did that with them. But, but they were yeah. just a little advanced. Go ahead. Yeah. And um, Lisa asked a question here. Do you think there's something about the size of the counties that allowed innovation to foster? And I think probably, I think probably, and I would say definitely not exclusively. I think there is a piece of, of, uh, of work that the leaders and the leadership teams um, can do that really foster a different culture. You know, I, I um, when I was you know, writing this Wapaka story too. I remember them saying, um, or, or just, I mean, we've done loads of stuff with them. I remember some of their supervisors saying like, I don't know, Chuck and Shannon coming to all these like all team meetings, you know, like this, the leaders are showing up in places and they're showing up in really real ways and they're showing up and being really open to the questions and they're showing up able to handle it. Amelia will talk about this, you know, briefly too, about our, our hold, being able to hold their feelings to be honest, you know, it's like, these are real people doing real work and they have some feelings about the changes and, um, and, and the leaders are super open to it. So I think, I think probably the, you know, size has made a difference. Um, but I would say that, um, I would say, I would say culture more so. What would you say, Amelia? You're on mute, but. Um, I said mindset culture, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Let's move on. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk to, you know, we, we, we've um, um, been discussing as you know, all along that we, during the cohort process about um, uh, data, like what are, what is it that we're trying to measure? Um, and we've spent quite a lot of time uh, measuring the things that you've just seen. So family you know, um, outcome, you know, agency, data and and uh, we are also trying to measure some of this not some of the, all this be, this middle part because we don't as at Aaliyah, we don't work directly with kids and families and so in some ways obviously that's the most important metric obviously if we do this work and this never changes then we got we're doing something seriously wrong and that's not our intervention so we're trying to also really suss out what is it the what is the what is it what did they do what did they change what had the the, you know, the, the, um, the effect that we wanted to have. And so what we're also looking at is, is, is our process. And we want to be able to learn from that as well. And we've done all these things of, you know, focus groups we have uh, done with the staff and how are you experiencing the change? And <clears throat> we've held summits and the peer-to-peer -peer support. I mean, they obviously have developed relationships that are not, that we are not a part of. And we've done trainings and workshops and breakthrough days and I mean, they've, the leaders have filled out worksheets about what's your theory of change. We like drilled it down and do you know what to say to your county board? Why are you even doing it? Why is this important to you? Why is it important to kids? Um, we've done anti-racism work and we started a, um, a specific group just for supervisors because we saw how important it was to have that kind of mid-level manager position to be able to know about the change that they're trying to make and be able to teach it on the ground. So that was super important. <clears throat> we brought costumes in and made the leaders do role plays about, you know, if your community member comes and asks you this, what are you going to say? So we've done, you know, all these things in advanced case consultation. So I just wanted to say, just point that out too, is that we're looking for data that are, um, uh, that indicate the change too, and and keeping our eyes on the prize, of course, of kids and families, but also want to be able to, you know, measure what we're doing. So let's just share a little bit about our challenges. 
Um, so we, this is all again spelled out all this material. We've got two different case studies on the um, uh, cohort that are available for download, and there's more about this there. But um, some of the things that were uh, consistent challenges for us, as you'll see, you'll see on the screen, um, was community resources. Like sometimes they just, they will say, "Look, I know what we need. We know what we need. It's real clear, but no one does it, or there's no money for it, or it just doesn't exist here." So that's been a huge challenge. What do you do when there's just simply no resource? Um, uh, uh, there's the race equity. That's just a piece, especially earlier on. It's you know more so a part of our work now, but earlier on we were just like we know this is super important and just it was tougher to be able to bring that front and center. I mean, not in small part because lots of these regions are pretty white. And so what does anti-racism look like? In fact, we had a webinar that's on the website too, but we held a webinar about what does anti-racism look like in, in rural counties? And what is the conversation among the staff? If you have you know, 200 staff and five people of color that work there, like what does that work even look like? So we're leaning into it more now, but certainly early on it was just a challenge for us to, um, to, to address. I mentioned about capturing data um, and, uh, um, and, and what are the right metrics to measure? How do you know, how do you measure systems change? That's been an ongoing challenge for us. I'll and add then, too that mm -hmm. um, there just isn't a lot of consistency from um, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And mm -hmm. so they weren't measuring apples and apples. So when mm -hmm. we asked mm -hmm. for data, they would give us different numbers or, or you know, they'd have to go hand count stuff that the right. data systems are just so terrible that they're like, oh yeah, we don't even track that. Or right. in order to answer your question, I need three additional staff for four weeks to go through files and count right. that. Um, right. You know, so there just is such a challenge um, uh, uh, to do that. Yeah, the, the, there we have had an evaluator all along, um, Lisa, and have some of the numbers and, and outcomes that you're getting those are, are cross-site. And we have you know, more data that we're gathering and looking at now into year two and, and we'll have a more um, robust evaluation report at the end of the project. But those were some of our midterm indicators. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then family voice that we, of course, knew like everyone is working on the, um, uh, how do we engage families? And so we've sort of started and stopped and, but, but struggled with that. And then community pushback. Um, in this is how we're kind of leaning into that is, is really about the uh, community co-creation. It's been so clear and obvious to us that these two top ones here, community co-creation and anti-racism are just, it is, that's the work, man. That is the work. Like, how do you, how do you work with families to create a new way of doing things? So we are leaning into uh, human-centered design because it's so clearly about coming up with new ways of meeting the needs of your human uh, customer. So we're really leading into human-centered design. Um, and as it, it, I'll just remind you about Dare to Share Power, which is a guiding principle of an unsystem. And where, where um, race, the made up idea of race shows up, there's power. And so when you share power, you're doing anti-racism work. So it's just, it's all connected. Um, and the developmental evaluation is really what we are, uh, um, you know, leaning into now too is like sometimes you have to look back. Like we we didn't know what to measure and we've pivoted. And so part of that, what we're uh, now uh, able to measure is, is 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 you know behind us a little bit. And then support supporting change makers. And then this is where I'll um, toss it to you, um, Amelia. And feel free to, again to 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 put questions in the chat. We've got about twelve minutes. So um, part of what we just wanted to talk to you about is this idea of what we're up to. I just think this change framework is so um, so relevant um, to the change we're doing. And and my mentor, Jack, um, he used to work at 3M, uh, shared this with me once. And I, I think it's hanging on the bulletin boards of every leader we've ever worked with. So essentially what, what we talk about is this idea of you know, we used to do things all the old way. So that up and down margins, all the old way. And we are doing less and less and less of that. Like we're learning how to separate fewer families. We're learning how to eliminate more disparities. We're learning how to strengthen and, and um, get involved in families earlier with prevention, right? We're doing less of the old way. At the same time, 
we're doing more of the new way. We're scaling up the new way. So if you can imagine the point of that green triangle is laying underneath the blue one, we're doing more and more and more of the new way till we're doing all the all of the new way and not the old way. And so um, what happens is when you're doing this kind of change process, and we're seeing this in all of our jurisdictions, is as they're scaling down and doing less, but scaling up and doing more, at the same time, you get to a point in the middle where you're like, ah, like, I can't stand this. Is it the old way or the new way? Are we doing it this way or that way? Do we make a decision? Are we going forward with this? Are we doing that old thing? And, and people start to feel uncomfortable, right? They really see a change as kind of loss and they wanna move back to where they knew the rules, where it was safe. And the challenge is that mostly it was safe for people in power. It was mostly safe for, um, you know, people who, who had privilege. It was mostly safe for uh, people who were not suffering racism. And so there is a push to kind of go back to what we know, to go back to the ways where we were comfortable. You know, this might be resonating slightly. Um, and, and what happens is by the time you feel that way, and I, I wanna offer this as some optimism for you as well, by the time it feels like, oh, we need to go back to where it's safe, you're already so far into the new way that people realize there's a difference between the old and the new and the momentum is forward. And so now you'll be moving into the new way. You're already leaning into that by the time you feel that way. But we just kind of talk with folks about the change management process, remind ourselves that we're in kind of that messy middle where, um, you know, the rules aren't exactly clear and, you um, because we work with humans, even if we have a better way to do things, you can't kind of shut down the emergency room to build the new better emergency room. You have to do both at the same time. And so it is messy and we just kind of live in that ambiguity and mess and want to tell you by the time you feel like you can't take it one more minute, you're really far into the new way. So um, the next piece of our work is really um, preparing and protecting change makers. So of the five cohort leaders, um, we have had two counties where uh, the leaders have been replaced, have lost their jobs, two where they've been promoted, and one is under taking a lot of heat, under a lot of fire right now. And so we are really desperate to learn about how do we prepare and protect leaders who are doing change. That, um, you know, a big part of what we teach early on is that when, when you create real change, not tweaking around the edges, but real change, you're asking people to give something up, something dear to them usually. And people get very, very uncomfortable and they start looking around for who is making me uncomfortable. Who exactly is making me uncomfortable? Oh, it's you. You know how I could get more comfortable? You could go away. <laughs> and so, um, so really thinking about that in deep ways. And we published our year one, um, cohort report, that red book that is free for download on our website. And we actually had to pull it back and write a section on it on guidance for leaders because it was heating up so quickly. And I, I want to really point this out to you. There were no serious, there were no child injuries, serious child injuries, no deaths. Um, what in fact they were doing was reducing numbers in care and um, saving a lot of money and um, in doing so and um, and still the fire was real, you know, so it's not like oh they did something something went wrong. It's that they were creating real change and so, so we, we have that guidance in the back of the book but we've done a lot more. Um, yes, that's right, Lisa, the impacting the, the foster care industrial complex, as well as the adoption industrial complex. You know, there aren't as many children to redistribute to other families if we're not separating families. So, um, so we, in that, you know, we take that as really those people, those leaders who go first, right? They're so, so, so brave. We sit in awe of them that they risk so much, their reputations, their livelihoods, you know, their, their financial security. They risk so much for all of us to learn that we're so serious about learning, squeezing every bit of learning we can out of this. So we have been um, working with some other change makers and harvesting everything we can. We've interviewed them. We've interviewed their staff. We've had the leaders who were let go write retrospects so we could learn from them. Um, we've consulted national experts. I mean, we've done everything we can. And, um, and we've learned a ton. And I'm going to talk about it at a keynote on Thursday at 11 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Mountain. So, so the pushback for change mm -hmm. is really, you know, we're gonna leave you without getting too much into this other than to say there's a ton we have learned, 
a ton we have learned. And now had we gone back into this with this wealth of knowledge, we would do things differently. You know, when we go into new systems, we would do things differently. We have pieces of information about how to really get people ready before they start and how to keep them safe during. Um, and they, some are surprising, but I'll, I'll tell you, um, yeah, it's 10 o'clock mountain. That's yes. right. The yeah. time's wrong. 10 mountain and 11 central. We're in central time zone. Um, and so what's so important about this is that you know, change gets disrupted when the leaders shift. So, so to sustain that momentum, we've got to find better ways to prepare and protect those leaders, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so we're doing a lot of work on that and um, can share what we know so far. We're also, you know, looking to partner with some other organizations who are doing adjacent change work in communities of color um, and really thinking a lot about how we might develop safety nets for these change leaders. You know, I think a lot about, could we get a foundation involved and start a, a place for people to go to learn all of this? And then the foundation would pay the salary of people who got let go. They'd be automatically qualified as faculty for a year and where you go to learn about this stuff. You know, I feel such an obligation to, you know, we feel such an obligation to preparing and protecting these folks. So, so come learn more there. Um, that'll be Thursday. And then uh, go ahead, Katie. Yeah, and that's, you know, I, the, the time is a challenge for those of us in the, you know, in the United States of America. Um, and we are also delivering a, a, a webinar just through Aaliyah that you can find that at our website too on preparing and protecting change makers, um, which won't be exactly the same, but you'll, you'll, you'll get the gist there as well. So I just wanted to um, put that here. And I believe, you know, we've, we're looking at three and a half minutes left. Um, did you so, want to have some closing remarks, Amelia, or yeah, take a few well, questions? Well, just to say um, uh, that particular case study is at 11 o'clock central um, on the 21st and would be a, a good summary of items as well. And those are all free. Our website's full. Everything we're talking about is free for download. Just yeah. we want to give it to as many people as possible. Use it. You know, if you want the slides, let us know. Like, just take it, use it, go. Um, yeah. The faster we can pollinate and spread the ideas, the better. And so um, really, um, you know, happy to have you do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing you have on here is we do a trauma effective leadership certificate, a 10 month virtual online leadership certificate mm -hmm. through the University of Minnesota. Um, so there's on that too. So we're happy to take any last questions. Yeah, any other um, questions from, yeah. the, from the group? I'm scanning the chat, to see if there was anything else, but uh, people can also take themselves off mute and ask questions. Yeah as well, we can have a conversation. I think we have seven minutes left, not, not just a couple. So we have plenty oh. of time. I think your clock is wrong, Katie. <laughs> like rushing through and looking. Oh my gosh, it sure is. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, so I didn't mean to be, I didn't mean to be so rushy rushy. So we're happy to to answer any questions or hear from you. Just even your reflections. Like, yeah. you know, what are your what are your thoughts in hearing this? I'm glad it, Joni, it's glad. And Joe, thanks. Well, um, I my first reaction is this was all done through just changing sort of mindset and sort of procedures. Uh, there was no changes to laws, there was no changes to anything else. And it's amazing. I think it's wonderful. I think it's great. Because um, I always thought, okay, when you're talking about a redesign, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna upset some people. Well, apparently they were inspired, but, <laughs> they were um, but, uh, but uh, I, I, I think that's great uh, because it was a major change, but it was not a, an expensive one, a time consuming or a, a resource intensive one where you had to buy all kinds of equipment and everything. So nice job. Yeah, nice thanks. Job. It does, there is a, a bit, and Marilyn wrote here in the chat too, but there's there's so much optimism, right? It's so much, pro, it's so much promise and feels so hopeful because I think we often feel like, oh, you know, there's never enough time. There's never enough money. There's never, you know, we're never going to be able to really do something. Um, and, and they, they were able to, mm -hmm. and, and frankly, 
some of them did this in the midst of really significant opposition, really significant. And, and I should say, you know, and I'll talk um, in Thursday in the keynote too, but we work in lots of jur jurisdictions. So we have these, these 14 counties, but we also have all the others we work with who are experiencing that, that pushback and change. And that, that resistance can come from all kinds of places, right? That mm -hmm. sometimes it was the foster parents, sometimes it was the union, sometimes it was the police, sometimes it was the school, sometimes it was the district attorney, sometimes it was the board of supervisors for the county. I mean, it came from, as we're talking about, you know, all over, it just really comes from a lot of different places. And these people persisted, really kept on despite that pushback. And, and it is, I mean, their personal sacrifice in achieving these outcomes, when I think about those outcomes as children, you know, I mean, that 61% reduction in, in Washington County, Maryland, like that is a lot of families who are safely together instead of that lifelong predictive harm we know separation can do. And, and that just makes me feel like, you know, we, we can do this. We're closer to this change than we think. Mm -hmm. Can, can I ask how um, I, I've, I've been, I was with child welfare before I retired for many years and for many, many years was, was very, very pleased with the, we had a safety organized practice model. I know Minnesota has that, you probably, Wisconsin. Um, and, and it was worked actually into the, um, the language, but the sad part is the substance of that mindset was lost when there was a change in management. And um, so now it's like we have the products, it sounds like it, but it's not conveyed. It's, it's kind of hollowed out. Um, and, I, and, I, and I see litigation as maybe being part of the problem. I'm not sure. Um, but I hope you sustain the change. Suzanne, I don't know what your question is, but I'm going to reflect on what you've said just for a quick minute here. So um, sometimes, just like in our family's recovery, right, it takes multiple tries until we get it right. One building on the next and that we go forward and then we get pulled back and then we go forward and we get pulled back. And there's sort of a parallel process at play that eventually the change sticks and then we move forward. And so I see that happening in child welfare too, that you know, all those beginning efforts were super important and, and they provided the bedrock and foundation and the evidence that things can change. So people did more. And then the, the, the tension came and the pullback came, but then they did more. And each time we build, we're further along than the previous. And, and so I think that you, you do that for a while and eventually you hit a tipping point and things begin to move. I mean, we've seen that in our country quite recently around racism, right? It's like all those things that happened and nothing happened. And now, you know, it's like it hit the tipping point and things are moving. And I think I'm going to predict for you in, in closing here that we are very close to a tipping point. I think we are less than five years away from people saying, you used to do what? Why did you do that? I really do. And I think that there's going to be multiple strategies and angles. And I, you know, there's so much to say about litigation. It has its place and it's had its harm. It's had, it has both. And, um, but there are many tools at play, the change in federal funding, the use of litigation, the evidence-based practice bill, the mindset shift that's happening, the way anti-racism is going to play into this. So many things are coming together and coalescing in really important ways. So I sit here thankful to you for the early work you did and so optimistic about the ways we're going to carry that baton forward on your behalf and on behalf of the children and families with whom we work. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that optimism. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay, Lisa, I think we're at time. We are at time. Um, yes, they are trailblazers. Um, well, probably everybody in the space is trailblazers, mm -hmm. but I want to recognize Katie and Amelia and their team for being, um, for, for trailblazing this next kind of path um, for us forward. So um, thank you for, um, your presentation. Thank you all for your uh, feedback, comments in the chat and everything else. 
And uh, we look forward to seeing you in another Zoom space over the course of the next couple of days. And as Katie noted, if anybody has questions, again, their website is fabulous, tons of great resources, fully free and downloadable and take and share and um, we'll keep this movement building. Maybe I'll see some of you right on. in yeah. a couple of nights. Yeah, yeah. come on. <laughs> Part two. <Yeah. laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you so Bye. much, Lisa. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks Lisa. Yeah, Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.